Good afternoon. Welcome to Queen's University. I was here as a student 32 years ago. I'm now back to interview two very important guests, both running for the Irish Senate, the Shannon. Hugo McNeil, former Irish Rugby International Chair of the British Irish Association and outgoing Senator Ian Marshall, former President of the Ulster Farmers Union, running again for the Irish Senate. Two very successful men in their own field, literally their own field, Hugo, you as a former rugby player, but you're deciding to get your hands dirty in the world of politics. Starting with you, Ian, why get into politics? Uh, quite, quite simply, when this opportunity came away, and it was actually a couple of years ago, and it was Phil Hogan, the Agriculture Commissioner, who had worked with very closely in my time uh, in the farming unions, and he put a call into Queen's and he said, look, the Taoiseach would like to nominate you to run in a, in a by-election for the Senate. So I, I did think about it, I spoke to the university to see that no one was conflicted or compromised, but for me, that was a fantastic opportunity because what I'd witnessed was that even though we're, we're geographically neighbours and we're very close and we live and work between, between two jurisdictions, that actually there's a huge disconnect between Belfast and Dublin. So the opportunity to, to run in this, I, I was delighted to receive that, that, that nomination. The interesting thing that I tell people was that my disconnect with Dublin was such that at the age I was, I had to Google where Leinster House was in Dublin. Really? Because I didn't actually know where it was because we had no connection with the politics of the South because we lived in the, in the goldfish bowl of Northern Ireland politics. So uh, that, that, that was the, the rationale behind because I thought here's a fantastic opportunity to, to dip our toe in the water and try and sort of building some bridges. Well, we look forward to hearing a bit more from you shortly. Hugo. Why was it the money that decided that you would like to get into politics? <coughs> well, I've always been involved, or I've always been interested in, in Northern Ireland, the North, however one wants to call it. From the earliest days, sort of playing rugby. Actually, in the earliest days, on going on holidays and a day trip to Newry, where we could get different sweets and, a, and, and different toys. We got mintolas and opal fruits and stuff. But my family were originally from Glenarm in Antrim. My, uh, my great grand uncle Owen McNeil was founded the Gaelic League and the Irish Volunteers. But I think it was the rugby, um, and that actually not the rugby, but bringing me, bringing me north um, so often. I got to know people um, as great friends. And people used to say, I used to play rugby in the, for Ireland in the 1980s, and people used to say, the great thing is you all play together, and nobody mentions the troubles, or nobody mentions the situation, the background, what was going on. And I kind of thought, well, that's kind of fine as far as it goes. But if I'd got to know you Mark, as a sort of somebody that I trust and depend on, like Keith and Nigel, who are, who are down here, we're sitting in a dressing room before we're going to go out to play for Ireland in front of 60, 70,000 people. And if I can't sit down at the end of the day and kind of understand a little bit what's going on in their background, coming from a unionist background, then how do you expect people who are sort of, you know, in very divided societies? So when I first came into the Irish team, nobody really talked about it. But as we sort of got a little bit older and were more established, we did talk. And I used to sit down and talk with Keith and Nigel and Trevor England, who became very close friends. And I loved the, you know, I loved the place. And I, I, you know, I loved coming up. I loved playing. I loved the sort of the teammates. And I've always sort of been involved in North South, whether it was Cooperation Ireland, whether it was the Ireland Funds, whether it was then suddenly the Peace International after the breakdown of the ceasefires or now recently in the British Irish Association, which I've chaired for seven years, which was an organization set up at the height of the troubles to try and create a safe space to bring people together who wouldn't come together otherwise. And it's still going today and it's still very relevant. But I sort of thought to myself, why am I doing this kind of part-time in, in a sense? And I said, I'd love to, I'd love to spend all my time. I'm also very involved in intellectual disabilities and Trinity Center. But I would love to spend you know, my time working on, Northern, and actually, in fairness to Ian, having got to know Ian in the last, in the recent, in recent months, um, over the last year, and the very important role that he's playing in fostering understanding, and I think that's what we'll talk about, in fostering, there's such a, Ian talked about the lack of knowledge of the Republic in the North, there's such a little lack of knowledge in, 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 in the Republic about, North, which is, which has, which has big consequences. And so I said, well, you can talk about it or you can actually do something. It's a very hard seat to win, the Trinity Senate seat, but I'm going to give it a go. And if I, don't, if I don't win it, if I win it, I think it will be a great platform to work with the likes of Ian to try and promote greater understanding which between the sort of the different, the different traditions on this island. And, and if I don't, I'll, I'll find another way to do it. 
hold that thought. Just to let you know what we're going to do, we've got about 40 minutes. We will finish at half past one on the dot. We would like to keep today as, in, as interactive as possible and, and get lots of questions or points you'd like to make. So we'll go for about 20 minutes ourselves and then we'll go out to the floor. Would you call yourself a Republican, Hugo? It depends what you mean by that. I mean, I have full respect for both traditions on this island, both main traditions. And I might, if some people say, what do I want? The first thing, I think there's two conditions that are very important for the, for the actual fulfillment of the longer term objectives of both the major traditions. Firstly, a Northern Ireland, a North that is at peace with itself, I think is a good thing in itself to fulfill the potential, the extraordinary potential this place has. But I think, and it's not always talked about, to me it's also an essential prerequisite for the long term ambitions of either of the traditions, either from a unionist side to be properly valued, respected, and cherished within the United Kingdom. That's not a situation that exists today. Or for the, uh, the nationalist or Republican or people who have the legitimate aspiration of a united Ireland, unless you start working from a north, from Northern Ireland that is at peace with itself, it's going to be impossible to do. And that's not understood in the, in the Republic. But wait, th there's no way the Republic would take on the north, Northern Ireland, which is not as at peace with itself, which is not reconciled, never mind the financial, just worry about the, all the other stuff. And the, no, the Republic is not, and we'll come back to this, the Republic has not got its mind around in what it means to incorporate the Britishness of, of Northern Ireland. The problem, when, a little bit in the schooling, when we, and anyone who's been to school in the Republic, the, the history that we learn is the story of the journey to being an independent country. Independent with its ups and downs, with its failures and successes, and ultimately becoming an independent. For many in the Republic, independent meant being not British and a defined in it. So it's very hard for a lot of the people in the Republic to get their minds around the topic that some of the Northern Unionist is a Unionist, is British, and is Irish at the, at, 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 at the same time. Because it's such, it's such at variance. And I think that's a really important point. And, and if, if the Republic is going to get, never mind what happens here, if the Republic is really to engage on the topic of a united Ireland, and it's having people like Ian who's explaining the sort of the unionist identity, there's going to be have to so much more depth of understanding than exists there at the moment. And the like, some of you may have seen the, the, uh, the, the, the BBC TV, or, or so the, the BT Sport about Brian O'Driscoll and mm. Rory Best. Did anyone mm -hmm. see that thing about shoulder to shoulder? Drums. Yeah, the lambeg drums and having. But to me, Mark, the most, sing, the, the most powerful image from that documentary was here was Brian with Rory Best, two great players, two great Irish captains, fully comfortable with each other, full of respect for each other, in the same way as Trevor and Keith and Nigel and I, we had the same. And Brian says to Rory, he says, Rory, I don't get it. You're, 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 you're Irish because you play for Ireland, but you're, you're British at the same time. And Rory says, yeah. And Brian says, I just don't get that. And in a sense, that to me sort of illustrated, for Brian O'Driscoll is not a bigoted person. Brian O'Driscoll is a very nice guy. But Brian O'Driscoll was expressing what was actually the position with the vast majority of people in the Republic. They don't get that. And when you kind of see that fuss on every season that we have Ireland's call, the start of the rugby season, we're going to have Ireland's call. Why are we having Ireland's call? Why don't we have an Ireland's call? You know, because when I went on to the, in the dressing room before we went out with Keith and Nigel, who are out there, and the, the last thing before we do, would, 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 would go out would be sit, uh, we'd sit down with the players who are closest to you. We'd go out on the field. I'm going to depend on them. They don't have an anthem that they can, that, that they can sing. So... There's a huge journey to be sort of faced. And for, for the people in the Republic, if you've got problems with Ireland's call, wait till you get into the, <laughs> wait till you get into the real matters of diplomacy. And, and, and so that's why understanding the whole, to me, and you, I'm sorry there's been a long-winded way of saying my own, to me, the unfinished business of the Good Friday Agreement, and hopefully maybe in this new decade, new approach, was mutual respect, was understanding, was reconciliation was the kind of things that we sort of were privileged to be able to sort of have through getting to know people by sport. But if that's to me is, is why it's so important.
So are you a Republican? No, I, I, I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm, I, I, I'm a Republican. I'm, I'm, Repu yeah, I'm a Republican. If having had got to the peace and reconciliation, okay, the the majority of people on the on, on in, in the uh, in, in, in in this part of the island and the rest of the island, if they want, if they voted for, for I would I would support that. But if they don't, I would support that too because I'm not in anything that's going to be forced against the against against the will. And I think. The problem with a lot of people in the South, we jump to the sort of the conclusion mm. without doing the boring sort of groundwork of reconciliation. But without either a reconciliation, the longer term ambitions of both the major traditions cannot be fully fulfilled. Thanks, Hugo. Ian, what would you say to my Orange Order friend who says, Ian Marshall, not a real unionist? Well, I think it's quite easy. What is a real unionist? Because I don't think anyone actually knows because Sometimes you, you, you have a lot to learn from the younger people in society. My 23-year-old daughter, my oldest daughter, was on the phone from England yesterday morning as I was driving down to Dublin. And she said to me something that was very interesting. She said, Dad, because we were talking politics, because she's unfortunately for her, she's interested. And she said, Dad, unionism. She says, do people not realise that there was a traditional unionist who's gone now? That unionism needs to modernise? It, it probably has different values. And that... The first thing is you've, you, the, the brand unionism hasn't moved fast enough or kept pace. And the second thing is that unionists actually haven't been very good at communicating to people what it is to be a unionist. It's fascinating. When I first went to Dublin, you know, people were amazed to, to say, oh, we didn't think a unionist would say that. We'd, the very day I was elected, I was interviewed by RTE on the plinth, and it was the mid, middle of the, the, the referendum on, on, the eighth, uh, on the abortion rights. And I was asked by the RTE journalist a, a, a curveball question. So he said, so Senator Marshall, how are you on abortion? And I said, pro-choice, always have been, always will be. And he was taken back. And Michael McDool, former Tonister and uh, Attorney General, who's in my independent group in the Shannon, said to me, my God, a Presbyterian that's pro-choice? Never heard the likes. <laughs> and I was amazed because that's that level of understanding. Mm -hmm. But, but you, you asked Hugo, was he a Republican? And, and similar question to myself. I always go back to my favourite book, which is To Kill a Mockingbird, and the Atticus Finch line in it. To understand someone, you've got to get inside their skin and walk around in it. Okay. I read, I was travelling with Queens, with, with Stefan on, on a trip recently, and I picked up a book when I was in the airport called The Beekeeper of Aleppo, and I read it. And it's a really good book, but what it brought home to me was we've become accustomed to labelling people. So if you're a Republican then and I'm a unionist, then by default I shouldn't like you. What I've, what I've found, and I have many friends in, in, in the Shannon, TDs and Senators in Leinster House who are Republican, who are die-hard, hard-line Republicans. They're very good friends. They're lovely people. But we create the label and then we dislike someone. And one thing I keep saying to unionists, actually, for someone who's a Republican, I need to respect that. I need to understand that. That doesn't mean I agree with it, but I have to respect it and understand it. And you know what? I can like those people. I can be good friends with those people. I always think that when you have a difference of opinion with people, you've got a number of options. One, you fight them. Two, you run away. Three, you put your finger in your ears. Or the fourth one is you sit down and you talk to them. I think we need to focus on the fourth one. Did you say your daughter's 23? Yeah. Have you got a 23-year-old daughter? Uh, yes. So have I. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we've got something in common. And we all live on the island of Ireland. Do you yeah. think our 23-year-old daughters will see a change in the constitutional status? of Northern Ireland. Hugo? I mean, it all depends on the first condition being fulfilled. Um, I, I think it's, it's it, but I don't think, I think you can't jump to the second without it. I think it's, it's a per perfectly, it's obviously <coughs> a legitimate aspiration for many people from a nationalist or Republican side to have uh, a united Ireland. But I'd always say to them, I said, what, firstly, what elements of Britishness are you going to incorporate in this united Ireland? Mm -hmm. But also, why, how can you, I think the onus is on those, actually on both communities, is to articulate a positive, inclusive version of United Ireland. And I haven't heard that yet. Mm. It's perfectly legitimate for nationalists or Republicans to, to, to aspire to. But I think, you know, I've, I've yet to hear, I'd love to hear the leaders of nationalism, like I'd love to hear the leaders of unionism, articulate what it is in a positive, inclusive version of a united Ireland or a positive inclusive version of the United remaining in the United Kingdom because the problem is and and uh, something Ian said I said I was saying to Trevor and Nigel and Keith 20 30 years ago guys you've got to and I lived in England for 20 years I said you guys have got to come up with a positive 
inversion of, of, of inclusive version of unionism. And it's not for me and other guys in Dublin. It's for the rest of the United Kingdom because they're looking at this and they're kind of saying, you know, for many years the dominant version when anyone thought about Northern Ireland in Britain was Ian Paisley. Now, Ian Paisley has many gifts and many great things, but for a lot of English people it was, it was produced as a reaction. And Anthony Kenny, who was one of the founders of the British Irish Association, said in the 1970s, the late 1970s, what used to bind Britain to Northern Ireland were three things, sentiment, self-interest, and morality. What did he mean? Sentiment, we felt a strong affinity and a personal connection. Self-interest, there were a practical use, like the ports, the northern ports in the Second World War. And morality, we weren't bombed out by Hitler, and we're not going to get bombed out by the IRA. And he said, only the last of those three now applies. The sentiment and the self-interest have, have not been gone. And that's the challenge, you know, and, and I think and Ian is sort of articulating, that's it. that is not to sort of try and undermine unions, uh, but it's, you, you saw in the recent elections, you saw in the Brexit, you saw the way Boris Johnson and others dealt with. So, you know, I think that what needs to be strong, bold leadership from both sides to articulate in a positive and, in, and in, in an inclusive way. And that's not, I can't see that at the moment. And that's why it's holding us sort of back of, 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 of this extraordinary part of this island fulfilling its true potential. Ian? Uh, would, would, would my kids see Irish unity? I'm not sure. I'm not actually as bothered as some people are about this because this is what I think. I think actually the biggest barrier to Irish unity now for, for Republicans is actually impatience because things are changing, things are moving on. We're having conversations now that we would not have had 10 years ago, and I think that's healthy. Furthermore, I think there's a couple of things we need to be cognizant of. The passage of time, and time's a wonderful healer. I'm now talking to people in Dublin and in Belfast, people who were at the coal face during the conflict, who are actually starting to talk about these things, and with thousands of people who are suffering PTSD. But these people are starting to talk and starting to communicate and starting to engage and have, have their attitudes have mellowed because of the passage of time. But secondly, my 21-year-old son sat Sunday week and watched uh, the Lost Lives film. Mm -hmm. And we watched it through, through and there wasn't a word spoken in the house. And when, when the movie went over, I said, well, what did you think? He said, Dad, that was a horrible time, but it doesn't mean anything to me. And I thought they're in, there's the nugget, there's the jam, there's the light at the end of this tunnel because actually with a generation of people who are growing up now who see this as history. I keep telling people when I was born in 1968 in South Armagh into a Protestant farming family, the Second World War was 23 years earlier. For me as a young boy it was about playing soldiers, it was about movies, about Hollywood, about newsreel and history. I had no connection. For my children there's a similar distance in time and there's a disconnect from it, and I think that's healthy, and I think that's why we're seeing the change in dynamics south of the border, especially because people who have no connection to this horrible period of our history are looking at things differently. And they're looking at Sinn Féin differently, and Hugo, you were telling me a story, I don't know if you mind sharing, about your, your daughter's experience of, of what she thought the rise of Sinn Féin in the south was down to recently. Well, she's, she was just she's, she was at school in England and, and came to Trinity to do a master's. She was in college in England, and she just said, uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, she said, the people, all my young the people in class with me are voting for Sinn Féin because they're the only ones who are telling me I'll get a house, that I'll have a way to get a housing. And, you know, they mightn't, but, you know, maybe some of the sort of projections are, you know, ambitious, but they're the only ones who are talking in that way. You know, the others are talking about structural issues and problems and it'll take forever and, you know, the system is broken. and. Um, and that was, you know, the, the reality. The people in the South didn't want to talk Brexit, and the way we came out of Brexit, we thought was a great achievement. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Everyone's sick and tired of Brexit, so the other parties didn't want to talk about something that was a government success. But I think there was a sort of a, it was, it was kind of, in, it was, it was, it was interesting, and it mirrors what he said. And that's, you know, that's right. I mean, you know, there's young, yeah, you know, that's why I think. The, 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 the election in, in the South was a shock to a lot of people. And I think you gotta, when you get a shock like that, you've got to listen and you've got to think, what, what exactly were people saying? Why, why exactly did this happen? Why in those numbers did people you know, vote in that way? Um, and I think it was, you know, it was, it was, it was, it's a real challenge. You're both very clear about what should be done. Can we talk a little bit about what you as individuals are hoping to do? You're obviously running for the Shannon. But you're, neither of you is a, is a member of a political party? 
No, and I, and I chair the, even though my wife is a sort of a Fine, Fine Gael uh, TD, I, I chaired the British Irish Association for a number of years and we work with all parties and all groups to bring to, to, to our annual conference, so it's very important that you be non-aligned and, and, and so that's what I, 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 you know, I would love, like I love coming up, I would love to spend a lot of my life on this, I, I think this is going to be a very interesting few years I've seen the massive potential of all sides in this part of the island and I'd love I'd love to be involved it's going to be complicated I've seen what's happening in the you know you took the decade of community of commemorations I look and saw what happened in the in the Republic to the to the RIC commemorations wait till you know we expect so hang on we we expect people up here to have forgotten what happened 20 years ago 30 years ago and we're not going to move on from something that happened a hundred years ago <laughs> How is that? And to me, it's just another example of the double speak of, you know, in, in the Republic. We just don't, we don't, I think, we don't get it. And I think if you're, if you, wait till you have, so that's, that was one community. It's going to be a tricky, you know, Brexit is going to be tough. We might not want to talk about it again, but you were starting to see that it's just not, not going to be as smooth. And that's going to be, that's going to put relationships under pressure. And one of the things we talked about in Ian and I, everything is the importance of building relationships and building, building dialogues. It's going to be tough. You see what Boris Johnson is saying. We're not going to maybe. We're going to. We're not. What we said we wasn't exactly what we're going to do. And Ireland will be the sort of the bad guys. I mean, painted in some sort of. Are we the ones that are are, are holding things back? So I think which are not. But I just think that 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 we're, you know, an exciting time because of the potential of, uh, yeah, the north Northern Ireland. But I think there's going to be real challenges as well. And I'd love to be rather than watching from the stand. I'd love to be, on the pitch in some way trying to play a constructive role on as it. Ever. Well, as ever. As ever. And Ian, you're not a member. You have no desire. No, no desire whatsoever, Mark. I suppose that independence is a, is a good place to be because you have no party whip. So what you say, what you see, you can say it as you see it. And I was told a long time ago by an elderly gentleman, if, if you speak from the heart, people will take it to heart. And I think that's the lovely thing about being independent. As well as that, as Hugo rightly says, this is about networks. It's about building relationships. You're not contentious, you're not a threat to anyone as an independent, so you can talk to everyone, and, and I do actually talk to anyone. So from that perspective, being independent has been a, a luxury that, that I'm, I'm very privileged to have been there and been free to speak things, speak from my, from my heart and say things as I see them, which for political unionism in the North has been difficult because a lot of the conversations I've had with, with party leaders has been, well, we agree with you, Ian, but we can't say that because we will lose votes. And therein lies part of the problem, because I think fundamentally people see, need to see what's, what's happening here. See, when is the last time that a leader of unionism has set out in a positive and inclusive way that their, their vision of Northern Ireland within great, the United Kingdom? And when's the last time that a leader of republicanism or nationalism has set out their vision of an owl island and a united Ireland with a generous, inclusive, full recognition, <coughs> reflection of the Britishness of a large percentage of the people? Where is it? I'm looking for those voices. I see it from. The, I see it in the likes of Ian. I see it in the likes. I don't see it when I look in the Doyle. I don't see it when I look in the Assembly up here. I don't see it when I look at the the parties at, at Westminster. And the people of this town deserve better. We they might see deserve it. Deserve better. Hopefully. We might see it if there's a border poll soon. Do you think it would help just to see that literally the lie of the land on the island of Ireland to have a border poll within the next five years or so? I fully. I fully appreciate uh, the desire and respect the desire for a united Ireland and the border pole within the terms of the Good Friday Agreement. However, I go back to my original sort of premise. I want what will make this place work first for all its people because that is an essential prerequisite. And I think jumping to a border pole now, I would say, and I know people feel strongly, look, we've waited, we've played by the rules, it's our turn now and you can't change the, the rules halfway through the game. I would have a lot of sympathy with what the late Seamus Mallon sort of said, was that it's not just enough about technical amounts of people, but you've got to create the conditions in which it's likely to maybe have a chance of succeeding. And I think that when the border poll and people in the Republic talk about border poll, we saw through the Brexit referendum the danger of going into something that's imprecise, that people don't know exactly what they're voting for. So what are the border poll? What would the border poll? Would it be sort of Irish unity? Would it be federal Ireland? What would be the role of Stormont? 
would we rejoin the Commonwealth? Would the, how, would, how would we fund the NHS? What elements of Britishness, what elements of, nor of, of the political parties up here would come into the door? 12th of July. And 12th of July. And the 12th of July, in a sense, as a remark, and the psalm and stuff are the easy stuff. You know, I think that the easy stuff. But I don't see a lot of the people who are in the Republic who are advocating and the number of academics for the border poll and stuff. I, my immediate next question is, okay, what are the specific elements of Britishness are you going to be incorporating? Because then if you're going to speak out and demand, you have to be generous at the same time. And I came up, I brought my, my daughter who's in Trinity now up for the 12th of July, July parades last year. And we were with, with Ian and that. And I'm watching as all the people marching and marching and marching down. Respect. And I'm saying to her, where? So when next time somebody you know, asks about a college over the United Ireland, just say, how are we going to accommodate the identity and the aspiration of those people you saw marching there today and the 900,000 or whatever the, whatever, whatever, whatever the number is, is, is right. Is, is, is. That's why I think it's just dangerous. And, and, people, and I think it's very dangerous for the Republic because I don't think the Republic has thought about these issues sufficiently. And in sufficient depth, there's the same simplistic sort of view about the inevitability of, 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 of this. And I think it's dangerous. And that's actually one of the main reasons I got, if I don't get elected, I'll try and find something through the British Irish Association. Because I think there's a need, and Ian has been a great example, a need of just cool heads and be, you know, a generosity of spirit, while not in a second diminishing the legitimate aspirations of any of the people in Northern Ireland to ultimately how this part of the island will be configured. Thanks, Hugo. Border poll, Ian Marshall. Uh, the interesting thing is we, we, we open our papers every day and we see another survey or another poll about mm -hmm. a border poll and about unity. And I don't think actually those surveys are that that relevant because one will say one thing, one will indicate something else, but fundamentally you've divided opinion on this. And when the question that I keep asking people, if you have the border poll, what do you do the next day? What, 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 actually, what, what mechanisms kick into place after it? Because at that point you probably have half your people feel very angry, very cross, that they've been taken somewhere they don't want to go. So for me, as Hugo already said, learn from Brexit. You can't ask a binary question from a very complicated set of circumstances. So the first thing is learn from that, start the conversation. But the reason why unionism doesn't engage with the Irish unity conversation because it's nearly as if it's a fait accompli. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, we're going to Irish unity now, how will we get there and will we find a, corner, a nice corner for you people? Mm -hmm. And that, that's not a conversation unions will ever engage. They will, however, engage in a conversation that says, let's look at Irish unity, let's look at the maintenance of the union, let's have that conversation. And let's see at the end of it when we let economists look at it, academics look at it, business look at it, and have this conversation when we know what this looks like, then it's perfectly reasonable to have a border poll. It's perfectly reasonable actually at that stage to ask the people, do they want unity? Because ultimately mm -hmm. unity will only happen when the people believe they will be better. And whether that's richer, better, education will be better, health service will be better, they will feel the benefits of unity, then the people will mandate. Unity. But you are accepting that you think the conversation, although it needs to be very carefully constructed, the conversation should begin? Without doubt, because back to my point, when you disagree with someone, putting your fingers in your ears doesn't actually achieve very much. So the conversation needs, needs to happen. So how do you square the circle of unionists, A, engaging, and B, being convinced or reassured that it isn't a fait accompli? Well, I, I think our earlier conversation about unionism defining what it is to be a unionist, what it is to be pro-union, what it is to be part of the United Kingdom, that argument has never really been made. It's, it's never really been communicated to everybody. So there's a fantastic opportunity for unionism to say, okay, here are the virtues of the union, here are the benefits of this union, and then have a mature conversation with those people who feel that it would be better in a United Ireland situation. I'm just not quite sure how you construct that. Does that mean that the British and Irish governments have to get involved rather than having a junior ministry in the south that, that is engineering this and driving it and promoting well, it? Well, I actually think it has to come the other way. I think it has to come from the bottom up. Okay. I think from the people up, because that conversation is happening in sports clubs, it's happening in yeah, bars and restaurants. Yeah, I think it's really important. And, you know, we in the British Irish Association, which tried to be balanced for, you know, years, and we used to bring people along for our conferences and really to be balanced from both sides. And we, 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 we sort of thought about, I mean, the, 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 the unity question had been kind of left one that we didn't, but we sort of realized last year, you've got, it's happening. And isn't it better to put a framework mm. around it of sensible analysis, of sensible thought, 
of trying to take in all the considerations of, as Ian's saying, not avoiding the situations of other referendums. And I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about those. Um, I'm doing it in a, in a sort of generosity of spirit. And this is where we really need leadership. And this is where we need leadership from, either from the main, from the main sort of sides, who are generous and inclusive. And I think without that, we're just going to get, we're just going to get, we're just going to get stuck. I mean, Bill Clinton said in Hall over there a couple of years ago, he said, compromise is not a weakness. Mm. Compromise is not a weakness. And we've, we've got to find, and we've got to empower leaders. And Ian made a very important point. He said some unionist leaders will want to say something, but if I say this, I'm going to get, I'm going to get, I'm going to get hammered. We've got to sort of change that. And whether the leadership is going to come through people within the main parties here, or whether that leadership is going to come from civic society, that's what we need. And I, and I say we need it as much in the Republic as we do because of the loose thinking that I've, that I've, that I've, that I've sort, of, sort of described. It's a big prize. It's, 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 you know, I've seen the potential. I've seen the best. I've seen the best of this part of the island you know, through my Catholic friends and nationalist friends, my days playing rugby. But I've also seen the, through the worst, as many people have seen. And Nigel Carr and Keith Crossan, as we caught up, Nigel was caught up in an explosion as mm. we were going to play in the World Cup. We didn't play rugby again. We were in the car beside. We were in the car <coughs> next next to it. So I've seen the best. I've seen the best. You know the quality and, and the loyalism. I just want to think with loyalism. My best friend you know, talk about Ulster loyalism. And we have a little young son, uh, James, who's who's four, who's had some health issues, and. Um, Apart from our family, who are always calling and asking, no one has called us more than Keith, Nigel, Connor, and our friends from, from Northern Ireland, the North. And so it's, it's, it's when you make a friend, you really make a friend. And I don't want to be facile or glib or, or, around this, but I'm just, I think there needs to be, there's too much fear and negativity around the leadership that we're seeing from the two main traditions. And I think that there's a need for leadership that's genuine, that's open, that's inclusive. Do you think your four-year-old will see it? No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> good point to open it up. Now, Nigel, oh, Jim Morris is here. And should I say, it's good to hear from a woman. We realise that we've got three middle-aged men with grey hair, all wearing blue suits. Yeah. Uh, we're very aware of that. Jim Morris. Thank you, You can hear it. You can hear it. Thank you very much indeed, Ed. Yes, uh, I have to do two things. First of all, I have to declare uh, 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 my hand, and then I have to declare an interest. Oh. My hand is I am actually a European unionist. Now, and I think that's a new breed of unionist, and I, but I think there's an awful lot of us about. And a European unionist answers all those questions that have been, you've been talking about there. So uh, I, I wonder, is there a place? And I said that was declaring my hand. Now I'm declaring an interest. I would like to stand for the Senate, the Irish Senate. Great. I have been, I've been trying to find out how to, and I can't <laughs> find out. I hear there's an election next month. <laughs> um, and so I've, I've written, I do, I, I, I do I have to wait for a tap on the shoulder? The, the fact is that I do totally think and agree that there should be much, much more cross-fertilization north-south. And there should be more unionists. And I know Ian's doing a great job. Fantastic job. But there needs to be more unionists, not just yeah. European unionists, others, so that people know what on earth the Senate is. How many people, I don't know, in this room or outside this room know what the Senate is, what it does, where it, where it exists? You know, people need to know much more. So if I want to stand, how do I do it? What do, do I wait for the tap on the shoulder? Thank you. Thank you, Jim. One of the microphones, I will keep a, keep, get a couple of points on the yeah. floor uh, over here. We're coming to you, Nigel Carr. I've never been to an event where you haven't spoken. Of, so. <laughs> 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 hey, um, I'm from an Irish Republican area, and um, but I would come from more from, obviously, I'm, I'm 37. And um, my question is, is that from a, from a younger point of view, looking at all this, is that um, I always get confused with how can we have a shared future if we don't even understand we have a shared past. And um, the reason why that is is that I know my Irish history, and I would talk to sometimes Protestants, and I'm telling them history, and sometimes I can tell it, it's actually too much. You know, I was saying, did you know that the father of Irish Republicanism is a Protestant from Kildare with, with Tone? Did you know that the first rebellion that started here was Presbyterian-led? 
and that they were inspired by the American Civil War, who were Presbyterians, who were forced out of England into Ireland, who were forced out of Ireland to America, and then they were inspired by the, the French Revolution. And then when you start to talk about this history, and the Irish language was saved by Protestants and Presbyterians, because Irish people were in no way, shape, or form able to do so at that time. And then you see this, what? Because at this point, even look at it, Anthony, right now, I'm not saying I'm right with this point of view, but it comes across to me like Ulster Scotch is Protestant and Irish is Catholic, and that's the way it's pushed, and it's not, it's all of ours. You know, my, my, fa my grandfather spoke Ulster Scotch. My granny, um, who was from Wexford, came up and she got a job in the north and she spoke Ulster Scotch. And, um, and my grandfather spoke to me also Scots as a kid, but he was living in the middle of uh, Spring Hill. <laughs> my goodness. You know, so... We this could do a documentary at the BBC. <laughs> 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 but, it, but it is so true. You yeah. know, part, and w the last thing I just want to say, what frustrates me, I was born in County Clare, and when I used to go down south, kids used to say to me, oh, you're from the Black North, mm -hmm. right? So the thing that used to frustrate the life out of me, because I, I start off with politics, history, and my first master's was in <laughs> political communications, public affairs. <laughs> And when I listen to Fianna Fáil be so hypocrites, lambasting the past as if they are not even part of it, their founder was Eamon de Valere and Countess Markovich, revolutionary. You know, so when you're listening to, you're saying about moving on from the South and this, it's the leaders in the hypocrisy that we have to listen to every day. And when you talk about the rise of Sinn Féin, the other thing I think that people don't understand is the influence of America. Bernie Sanders is in, for a socialist is unbelievable. And young people are listening How to How do we him. get the Bernie Sanders? <laughs> <laughs> seriously? No, but, but, but really, though. No, but seriously, okay. though. My, yeah. um, that's yeah. the last point I'm going to make. I have an uncle who would never have voted Sinn Féin, ever. Okay. He was Féin of all his life. And he's been listening to Bernie Sanders, and he voted Sinn Féin this time for the first time <laughs> in his life because it resonated with what Sinn Féin was saying down south. Okay. Have we one more question from the floor before we go to our panel there? Gentlemen there, please. Just an observation. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Another question. <laughs> Sorry, with big voice. Um, then just take what you want. Seven weeks worth in South Africa. And to pick up Ian's point, the age of his children, the youngsters in South Africa are just the same. They've no interest in apartheid. Their parents and grandparents are influenced by it. Their voting sentiment is in that direction. But the youngsters are interested in opportunity, economy, and their own future. So there's a strong parallel there. So unpack some of that. Hugo McNeil. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, it's... Complex. Yeah, I think people, the young people want to move on. The young people want leadership. The young people want to sort of people speaking about who are resonating what's important to them, which is exactly you know in a sense what this gentleman said from over o over here. And I think that's what we that's what we need to do. Ian, that, that, from the back Black North, have you ever faced any of that well, even subtly? Well, well, listen. Uh, there's a really interesting thing. I work in Queens with uh, a couple of really great girls. They're from the New Lodge. And we had a meeting one day up in the university with a very, very much an international group of people. And one of the, it was the middle of the summer, and one of the English girls said something about a bonfire, to which my colleague took out her phone and says, I'll show you a bonfire. And she held her phone and says, oh my goodness, that's, that's, that's huge, what size is that? And the, the conversation went on, and, and my colleague said to me jokingly, w our people can build good bonfires, Ian's ones can't. <laughs> and I said, well, you build big ones, but ours are architecturally and structurally more superior than yours. But we started to compare things. And the, and the insults that we've treated each other are interesting, because in Protestant communities, you talk about someone with kicking with the left foot was a Catholic. And Julianne says, no, we talk about Protestants kicking with the left foot. Really? Well, I says, at least we know your eyes are too close together. No, she says, Ian, Protestants' eyes are too close together. Mm -hmm. And then black bees is another reference that we treat. So both communities are treating exactly the same insults mm -hmm. to each other. So, and, and I think there's an interesting thing you make, the political side of this. I went to a Protestant grammar school in Armagh. Good school, but my history was about kings and queens of England, Tudor Elizabeth, mm -hmm. England, War of the Roses, mm -hmm. world history. The history is very different. I, I, I was, in the, I was in the, uh, with the American ambassador last 4th of July, and uh, uh, was, uh, sorry, 2018, the World Cup was on. And there's a big screen up and uh, everyone that was gathered for the garden party were watching Colombia play England. And every time Colombia picked up the ball, the cheers and whistles went up. And every time England picked up the ball, the boos came out. So the next day I had 25 young politics students in Leinster House just to see. I was a bit like the circus act because here's a unionist from the north. Can we poke him? Can we, does he breathe and breathe the same air that we breathe? But the conversation, I, I asked them where the anti-English sentiment came from. 
because I said you, you, you follow English Premiership football, mm. you shop in English shops, you go to English universities, watch you watch English TV, TV. Yeah. you're culturally so close to England. Mm. And they couldn't tell me, and I, I suggested to them that they'd absorbed that from their parents and grandparents. They'd actually got no justification for it. And the interesting thing was they agreed. So I think the, the politics is interesting, but the history, it, was, it is important to look back. But for my children, for all the young people here, this has been looking forward. I think you need to acknowledge and reference what's gone on before. But there was no one, one side were right or wrong. And it wasn't until I went up to Leinster House last year, for example, that I learnt the history of the Irish flag. As a young Protestant at a grammar school in Armagh, I would have burnt the flag at school. Would you? Because, the, because it, was, it was weaponized and used as something which was anti-Brit, anti-Prod, anti-Union, <coughs> in the same way the language is. And remember, the, the leaders now are the people that also grew up in that genre and that generation of the language was something that was confrontational, it was something that wasn't about us. And it wasn't until I went to Leinster House that I learnt the Irish flag is 1848, that the, the green symbolised for nationalism, the orange for Protestantism, and the white for peace. The only person that could tell me that in the last six months and explain that they, they understood that and they knew that was a leader of a loyalist paramilitary group in East Belfast. That was the only person that knew that. So I think we have a lot to learn from history, but we can't dwell on it. We have to reference it and acknowledge it, but we need to look forward. The important thing is on the history, and you, you, the point you made is we sort of had learned different histories, and then people try and import other histories, and people say, well, look at East and West Germany. Well, East and West Germany were both German before they were sort of separated. The sort of the, the, the German for reunification was Wieder, Wieder for Einigung. Wieder in Germany means again, in German means again, so unity again. So again, sort of simplistically taking what was in Germany and saying, trying to apply it to what's in the North is just wrong. And it's kind of dangerous because it's, 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 it's really showing a lack of sort of understanding with what's going on. And a quick one on Jane's point, do we, any advice how to run for the Senate? <laughs> <laughs> well, don't come into not the not Trinity because it's competitive enough at the moment, you know, <laughs> <laughs> seriously. I'm having a hard enough time with the three that are there. Look, without someone like Jane coming in, I might as well give it up. But I think, Mark, uh, and I would agree, sit this one out, Jane, prep yourself for the next one. <laughs> don't go on the agricultural panel either. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's described, I think it's best described at the moment, the Senate election, a bit like the Grand National. So for anyone who follows horse racing, the one race you wouldn't back a, or bet on is the national mm. this is a very big field there's a lot of riders and runners there's going to be a lot of fallers at the first there will be a lot of casualties on the way around and uh, it, it's it's anybody's game at the moment so it's such a we're thing. all going to be watching very carefully not least because of you guys uh, wh what's the time scale for it all if the, the close of voting is the 30th of March okay so then we know the week that's the Monday so that week counting commences so we know hopefully by the end of that Can week the uh, county councillors and TDs and senators. So there's it's somewhere around 1,200 people vote in the Senate elections. And Hugo, your wife's just been elected to the Doyle mm -hmm. successfully. Mm -hmm. No pressure? <laughs> I know. It's a very tough act to follow. You know, Jennifer is, is, had worked in politics for a long time and then she was only recently asked to run for a local election last year and she smashed it in the last summer and then she went was asked to uh, run in the general election. And for Fine Gael. Fine Gael. yeah. And she is the smartest person I've ever met and the best communicator I've ever met so she's deeply intimidating but uh, <laughs> a great example and uh, <coughs> she's very helpful to me now in my campaign. And just while you're here uh, <coughs> what do you think is going to happen <coughs> down here obviously you don't have any party alignment what do you think is going to happen in terms of the new government would you have any insight? I really do I really it's it's, it's complete confusion and I think I, I really don't have a sense I don't don't have a sense of so many permutations at the moment it's and I don't know when it's going to Yes. And it's going to get sorted out as well. Well, we'll open up to the floor. Yes, we've got a couple more quick questions. Oh, there, there we are. Tony's there. Is that Tony? Yeah. Here's Tony. And then. Oh, right. We'll take all those here, and then we've got about five minutes left. So let's go. I'm sorry, hi, so I'm sorry with the disclaimer. I'm French, so there's stuff that I maybe didn't understand. Um, so you talk a lot about education and history. Um, do you think about concrete ways to uh, make it better for uh, different communities to understand their background and the past? Uh, would it be like reforming curriculums, uh, encourage integrated schools, or cooperation between different denominational schools? What would be a concrete solution to, you know, talk, talk history better? Really good question. So, what concrete proposals, Tony? Uh, Hugo, I thought your comment right at the very start was very important about the amount of work that needs to be done before we can constructively address uh, issues around the constitutional future. 
But politics in London at the moment is very strange. Yeah. Um, and I wonder the extent of which you think there's a risk that decisions made there because of who knows reasons for who knows what could push us into a situation where we're faced to deal with some of these issues way before we're really ready to do it. One more. Thanks, uh, Mark, uh, I'd like to put the spotlight on you slightly. Time You're is running uh, very <laughs> short. <laughs> I'd like to ask our two very learned and um, uh, inspirational speakers to say, are the media part of the problem? Yes, are you the fermenters of the discourse and you are unable to provide fair and balanced news because you're obsessed with the past. If Martin McGuinness used the word conflict junkies, some people tell me that is the title that should go to the media first. I'm not blaming you f personally, Mark, <laughs> but I would like to hear the views oh. of uh, the uh, learned speakers. Thank you. Two good questions there. <laughs> <laughs> You go in, pick whatever one you want and answer that. <laughs> On the question of education and our friend from France, uh, look, I think since I've started coming up here, there's been talk about more integrated education, but I don't think it's ever moved between 6 and 8%. Mm. I, I think it should be, and May Blood, I was one of my heroes, and, but that's, that, that could probably take a whole session in itself. Yeah, I, th I think on the education one, uh, it's interesting because I don't think this is as complicated as we make it out. But we've got fundamental problems. We still train our teachers in Northern Ireland at two different training colleges. We train Protestant teachers in Stonemillis, we train Catholics in St Mary's. It's wrong. Yeah. I think if we're going to change this, yeah. that what we do, if I was Education Minister, I would like to say that all kids at primary education are educated together. If you as a parent want your child to go to a Catholic primary school or a Protestant primary school, you pay for them to go. Yeah. We would change it within a generation because the people that I work with in the Senate their children went very often to mixed primary education. By the time they go to leave and some went to Jesuit school, some went here and never, they have no prejudices. When you grow up in a class of young people who are all different, different cultures, different identities, different religions, I was in the Irish Embassy this week and one of the ladies who spoke said that in her, her daughter's class in school, there were no parents that weren't mixed culture and mixed identity. So they're growing up in this complete melting pot. If you get primary kids into that position, by the time they go to move on at 11 or 15 or 18 or whatever, I work with a lot of people who, who never fraternised with or socialised with or spoke to a Protestant or a Catholic until they went to Queen's. And that's horrendous. So if we're going to change it, primary education. Is and to tell you a point, I think it's a really good point about what happens in, in London because I'm afraid I don't think Northern Ireland is very high in the priority of the people making the decisions in London. And it's disgraceful and it's wrong, but it's, we're not going to change that. And I think your question is, uh, very important that somehow are going back to the point and the Seamus Mallon's point the context around absolutely right for framing these difficult decisions or around complicated subjects like if Peter Robinson says it's something to, um, to think about you know I don't you should think about it but in a framework in a balanced in a balanced framework and the danger the danger of uh, can't get bounced in this is again going back to strong leadership and you can't strong leadership backed by civic support because the worst thing, which is the vista that you're, you're painting, is that we kind of get b bounced into something that is wrong for the North, for Northern Ireland, um, just because of a fallout from what's going on in, in Westminster. And let's take the media question to be serious about it. It is a, it is a serious question. What would you say to that point? I, I definitely agree with it. There, there is substance to that point because, unfortunately, what we miss in Northern Ireland is actually that doesn't sell sell newspapers. That doesn't make the headlines uh, uh, the way that the good stuff that's happened. There's lots of good community work going on in loyalist groups, in Republican groups, community work that's going on, but it's never reported because it's not really good news. It's not exciting news. I think there's a responsibility by the media, by the press, to actually take commentary from people who are credible people who are not very prejudiced, who are not very biased, who aren't polarised, because sometimes we look, we turn on our news, we look at papers, and we think that an individual is reflective of a community, and actually the community itself know that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a responsibility by the media to, to report things as they are, because what I keep going back to in Northern Ireland is that the silent majority are still there. They haven't gone away. And the reality is most people, irrespective of their background, want health, education, better future for their kids. They don't wake up in the morning thinking about the Constitution. Mm. It's putting food on the table. It's the job. It's school. That's the things that are important. So I think the media have a responsibility. 
because I think that, that people, especially now with social media, look at Twitter feeds and, and assume that who they follow is reflective of all society, even though it's only a microcosm mm -hmm. of society, but you generally connect with people who are like-minded, so, so you feed off them, so yeah. I think there, there is an issue there. And Hugo, final word to you. Do you agree about the media? Yeah, I think I, I'm, in, I'm less familiar with the, lo with the local media here, here so I don't want to, I'm wary of commenting on something that, that I don't really know about. But I, the point I'd make, the general point is, I think there is a need for constructiveness and positiveness from all aspects of the sort of community, whether it starts with political leadership, it takes up with community groups, it takes up with civic society, and it takes up the media. And I just, you know, so I don't want to be apple pie or mother, you know, motherhood ever. I love this place. I really believe in this place. I believe in the people. I actually sort of gave up my job to try and run for the Senate in a thing that I'm probably not going to win in order to spend more of my time sort of working on it. And I just, with you, you deserve, uh, but I think all the sort of aspects of society have to sort of get together and have a, has a role to play, a positive and constructive role, and the media are important in that as well. Uh, I think, Mark, that just, just on that, uh, Last year when Seamus Mollins' book came out, I remember Seamus Mollins, a neighbour, was, was a neighbour of mine in Mark Martell, Martell, yes. and when his book came out, I called with him one night and said, will you sign my book for him? And he said, goodness, Ian, I've never been asked to sign books. Well, I said, you've signed a lot of important documents, would you sign this? <laughs> so he put a lovely verse in the front of it, wish me all the best in, in the Senate, and he said, keep, 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 keep up the good work, keep opening minds and opening doors. And that's what, that's what the Senate's about, it's about opening minds and opening doors. And I used his line in my maiden speech, which was, it doesn't matter what we call this land as long as we all can call it home. And it's a fantastic line. And I think if we use that as our stop line for Northern Ireland, we'd get everybody to, to find it as home. Well said, Ian. Ian and Hugo, thank you both very much. <laughs> I have an idea. Queen's University should organise one of these events to address the very question that you talked about. I'll be on the panel because I would like to say something and genuinely I couldn't squeeze it into two minutes. And I've, alre I've already got a host, Jane Morris, Senator Jane Morris, <laughs> former BBC journalist, is going to host it and we're going to call it Forgive Us Our Press Passes. <laughs> Thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>